Corinthians chapter one. Okay, try again. First Corinthians chapter one. We'll begin reading uh, in verse four down to verse seventeen. And so it begins this way, 1 Corinthians 1, verse 4. I thank my God always on your behalf for the grace of God which is given you by Jesus Christ, that in everything you are enriched by him, in all utterance and in all knowledge, even as the testimony of Christ was confirmed in you, so that ye come behind in no gift, waiting for the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ who shall also confirm you unto the end that you may be blameless in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. God is faithful by whom you are called unto the fellowship of his son, Christ, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Now I beseech you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you all speak the same thing and that there be no divisions among you, but that you be perfectly joined together in the same mind and in the same judgment. For it hath been declared unto me of you, my brethren, by them which are of the house of Chloe, that there are contentions among you. Now this I say, that every one of you saith, I am of Paul, and I of Apollos, and I of Cephas, and I of Christ. Is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you? Or were you baptized in the name of Paul? I thank God that I baptized none of you but Crispus and Gaius, lest any should say that I had baptized in mine own name. And I baptized also the household of Stephanus. Besides, I know not whether I baptized any other. For Christ sent me not to baptize, but to preach the gospel, not with wisdom of words, lest the cross of Christ should be made of non effect. And again, God will bless that reading uh, of his word to us this evening. And uh, as a title this evening, I want to just uh, put three words together gifted, expectant, and unholy. And I think it's a good description of the assembly in Corinth. They certainly were gifted. They came behind in no gift, and they had a great love for spiritual gift and its use and development. And they were waiting for the coming of the Lord Jesus. And so that sounds a good thing too. And yet, sadly, their giftedness and their expectancy did not produce a holiness of life. Oh, yes, they were positionally sanctified. We learned that last time, that they were sanctified in Christ Jesus. They were set apart the day that they were saved. But we're going to see that their conduct uh, was certainly practically not very holy. And there was contentions amongst them. And of course, as we go through the epistle, we'll see lots of things that were completely contrary to the holiness that would become a child of God. And so it's really a good reminder to all of us that gift and spirituality are not synonymous things. Sometimes we can get carried away, wowed by someone's gifting and think, oh, he must be a really spiritual person. And yet we can be shocked later on to find that they were living a double life. And yes, they were very good communicators and the gift was still there, but there was a, uh, an underlying unholiness of character and life that was their undoing. And then, of course, it's very possible to be somebody who loves prophecy. Now, prophecy should produce holiness. Uh, he that has this hope in him purifies himself even as he is pure. It should produce holiness. But sometimes, especially in a society like Corinth, where there's a love of of kind of knowledge and, you know, people could be all into their prophetic charts and have everything kind of clearly in order and everything clear in their minds and be very articulate, even in talking about prophetic events, and yet still live holy, unholy lives. And so it's a real challenge to us uh, about the importance. Yeah, it, these things are important. It's important to know what your gift is and use it, and we're not going to diminish that. It's important to live in expectancy of the coming of the Lord Jesus, but also we need to live in a way that we will not be ashamed before him at his coming. And so that's kind of the challenge that uh, I feel is before us in this little section. And so when it comes to his thanksgiving, we kind of just begun to talk about this last time, that he does always seem to find something to thank God for. And in this case, it's to do with the things that God has done for them. 
uh, his grace in the past when they were gloriously saved, uh, the gifts they have in the present uh, that they're clearly are very evident in the assembly there. And then uh, as he thinks about the future, he thinks about their guarantees, uh, the very fact that you may be blameless in the day of the Lord Jesus Christ, uh, that uh, God is going to do that. He's going to confirm you to the end that you may be blameless in the day of the Lord Jesus. And so he thinks of their future guarantees. And so he's thankful for all these things, God's grace, God's engiftment, and God's guarantees. But really, none of those things are very personal to them in the sense that when he's thankful for the Philippians, he, he'll talk about uh, how grateful he, he was for their fellowship in the gospel from the first day until now. And he's got a lot of personal things to, to thank God for about them. Uh, for the Thessalonians, uh, he, their work of faith, their labor of love, their patient of hope, uh, all the thanksgiving is to do with things that, that where the word of God is being worked out in their lives. When it comes to Corinth, he don't really say any of those things, just acknowledging uh, how blessed they've been in terms of grace, gifting, and their guarantees. And so that really sets the tone, doesn't it? It kind of tells us what's coming. He's thanking God for what he can thank God for. But it would be nice if he could have thanked God for their fellowship in the gospel. If he could have thanked God for uh, how from them the word of God had thundered out like at Thessalonica or something like that. But no, he just finds things to be thankful for in terms of what they have as an, a gift from God in terms of his grace. And of course, it's good to be thankful that grace has come to Corinth and that there's a testimony to the name of Jesus there. And also, he goes on and says that in everything you're enriched by him. And it is wonderful how enriched our lives have been since the day we received the Lord Jesus, how he has blessed us and benefited us in so many ways. And uh, of course, we, we know the scripture is replete with talks and talking about the things that we have, all the spiritual blessings we have in heavenly places in Christ, that we're complete in him. Uh, we're really blessed people, but we're also blessed in terms of being given spiritual gifts that were given to us at conversion. And certainly that's what is in view when he thinks about the Corinthian believers. They're enriched by him in all utterance, he says, and in all knowledge. And so particularly he's speaking of gifting that looks something like this. All utterance has the idea, it's the word logos, and it's the idea of um, the fact that we've been, they, they had been given uh, the ability to, to discourse, uh, to, to speak, uh, about the truth and to to give outward expression to the truth of God. And they were very articulate in being able to communicate those things. And then he says, not only in all utterance, but in all knowledge. And of course, that's the inward apprehension the, the of truth, that ability to understand truth. So of course, to be able to articulate truth, you have to understand it. And God had given them that ability. There are people who understood the truth of God and they knew how to articulate it and to do it well in a very convincing way. And yet, again, it shows that there's a problem sometimes. Sometimes we know what the Bible says, and we each share it with others, but our difficulty sometimes is applying it practically to our own lives. And we're going to see that that is the big issue in Corinth. They, they have a lot of knowledge. And he's going to tell them knowledge puffs up. They're, they were like walking Bible dictionaries. They had a tremendous grasp of truth, but it wasn't changing them. It wasn't, as it were, reaching their hearts and then working out through their wills in terms of their action. It seemed to just be a very heady thing. And there's a danger, especially in evangelical Christianity, to have a heady knowledge of the truth, but to it not really permeate and affect our lives. And so he, he certainly can say of them, yeah, they can, they can articulate the truth and they have a good knowledge of the truth. And again, this is part of the blessing God has brought to them. And they certainly are well endowed as far as gifting is concerned. And so he, he talks about uh, that the testimony of Christ is confirmed in you by this gifting. So it's an evidence that they're really saved is that they have these supernatural gifts that have been given to them by the Holy Spirit. So you come behind in no gift. So all the gifts were very evident 
in the city of Corinth. And of course, that's a big theme that we're going to see uh, throughout the epistle, uh, their, their fascination with gifts, their, their use of gifts, and their eagerness to use gifts when they came together. Every one of you has a psalm, has a tongue, has an interpretation. And, and th there was no awkward silences at the meetings in Corinth. Everybody was, as it were, loaded and ready to speak. And by the way, that's something that we can learn from, in a sense, that sad, sadly, uh, I was recently at a prayer meeting, and one person prayed, and I want to tell you, the, the long, awkward silence for the rest of the time was utterly painful, and so we can learn from Corinthians. When they came, they were ready. I mean, they had something that the Lord had given them to share, so they certainly gifted people, but again, we would say this. Sometimes, too, there are some assemblies that seem to be more richly endowed with gift than others. And of course, part of the difficulty with that is the Bible says every believer is gifted. Tonight, I'm addressing the gifted class at Brockview Bible Chapel, because every one of you are gifted by the Holy Spirit, if you're believers. You all have gifts. But so when we say some assemblies seem to be more uh, as it were, uh, better endowed, more richly endowed with gift than others. What that really is saying is that some assemblies have seen the believers develop and use their gifts more than other assemblies. And there is a danger to, to have been gifted by the Spirit and not to really use your gift or develop your gift. In 1 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 14, Paul encourages Timothy, neglect not the gift that is in thee, which was given thee by prophecy with the laying out of the hands of the presbytery. And so it's possible to neglect the gift that is in thee, to not develop it, to not use it. And it's wonderful when a gift is properly developed and used for the glory of God. Uh, you've probably heard the story of Harold Sinjin. Uh, that a woman came to him and said to him one day, I'll give the world to know the Bible like you know it. She'd heard him speak and she could see this man has a wonderful grasp of scripture. And his response was, that's what it cost me. I'll give the world to have the Bible knowledge you have. That is what it cost me. He had to sacrifice being distracted by the world in order to develop that ability to understand the scriptures and communicate them well. And so again, it's a good challenge to us tonight. Uh, how are we doing in terms of knowing what our gift is? Do we know what it is? Are we using it? And of course, not forgetting the big message tonight, which is making sure that you're living a holy life as you use your gift and not being carnal and fleshly as was evident in the assembly in Corinth. And so clearly uh, Christ's testimony was evident there because they were gifted by the spirit and it was obvious that they had received this gift and it was very clear that it was seen in all of the saints and they came behind in no gift they had everything that was needed and then he talks about the future so you come behind in no gift waiting for the coming of our lord jesus christ and that word waiting is the idea of strained with expectation. They were eagerly, like the Corinthian, like the Thessalonian believers who were waiting for his son from heaven, even Jesus, that delivers from the wrath to come. Well, the Corinthians also were eagerly waiting for the coming of the Lord Jesus. They had that earnest expectancy. Uh, they loved the truth of the coming of the Lord. Paul had obviously taught it when he was in Corinth, and they loved it. Now, uh, the word that's used here, the coming of our Lord Jesus, the word coming is the word unveiling here, and it usually is used in connection uh, with his coming in glory at his second advent as opposed to the rapture and certainly there is an expectancy and an eagerness for that day and i think we have that day too don't we we're, we're tired i think i don't know about I'm, i speak for myself but we're tired of corrupt governments uh, we're tired of ineptitude in government and we're longing for a day when a king will reign in perfect righteousness on the earth. Uh, we're looking forward to that day when Christ, who is still despised and rejected of men, 
when when he will be acknowledged as king of kings and lord of lords and be seen in all his splendor and all his glory and certainly we look forward to that day with great eagerness and so they were looking forward to that day but they hadn't forgotten the rapture either because in the next verse he says who shall also confirm you to the end that you may be blameless in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. And of course, when we see the term, the day of the Lord Jesus Christ, it usually is in connection with rapture and reward. And so the idea was this, that he would confirm them to the end, uh, these Corinthians, uh, even <clears throat> uh, that they would be blameless in that coming day. And so there's kind of a promise there of, of what they could look forward to in the future. Uh, that they would be preserved. And it's wonderful, isn't it, that God does preserve us. And uh, he, he keeps us. He saves and he keeps. And of course, the reason he does all those things is given to us in the next statement. This is a beautiful statement, uh, one that I've been meditating a lot on recently. It just simply says this, verse 9, God is faithful. He's faithful. And he's faithful to keep his promises. And so whoever believes on him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. He keeps his promises. He's faithful. The faithfulness of God is a marvelous, marvelous thing. And so it was as a result of the faithfulness of God that these, well, the one that had begun a good work in them would complete it. And so we're thankful for that. And we're thankful for the, the marvelous, amazing truth of the faithfulness of God. I was speaking to somebody recently, and uh, this is a special time for us. It's our uh, anniversary time in that um, in 1984, 31st of May, and my wife and I left secular employment and we went out looking to the Lord to supply our needs. And here we are. All these years have gone by, and I could say to people, I don't know what it is to live by faith, but I know a lot about what it is to live by God's faithfulness, because my faith is, well, it's up and down, but his faithfulness doesn't change. Isn't it wonderful just to bask in that truth that we serve a God who is faithful? He can't deny himself. He abides faithful. And so how marvelous the faithfulness of God. God is faithful by whom you were called into the fellowship of his son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. What a marvelous thought this is to the, the fact that we, we we heard a lot about calling didn't we in that uh, message last week uh, paul a called apostle this church that's called out from corinth uh, to the name of the lord jesus they're called saints uh, and it's to all who in every place call on the name of the lord jesus and here we have this amazing truth that we were called into fellowship with the Lord Jesus Christ. And this is the, the important thing that we need to grasp, really, that in the Christian life, it is we're brought into communion with divine persons. And I don't know if that, maybe we just get used to this, but we shouldn't. That here we are, the Corinthians ourselves, sinners of the Gentiles, once so far off, and now by grace, were brought into fellowship with divine persons. And this is a marvelous, marvelous theme of the word of God. And if you look at the first epistle of John, that's one of the great themes of the apostle John. He just, he, he finds it amazing, an amazing thought, even late in his life, as he comes towards the end of his journey on this earth. And, and he, yet the, he's still filled with the wonder of it all. And, and so he says, for that which we have seen and heard in, in 1 John 1 verse 3, declare we unto you that ye also may have fellowship with us. And truly our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. And then Paul would say to them at the end of 2 Corinthians in chapter 13 about the communion of the Holy Ghost. And so he'll say in chapter 13, verse 14, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Ghost, or the koinonia, the fellowship of the Holy Ghost, be with you all. Amen. And so isn't it a marvelous thing to think of who the Corinthians were and now what they have been called out of and then what they've been called into? into this fellowship with divine 
persons. And, and how marvelous he, when he talks about the Lord Jesus, he talks about the fellowship of his, his son. And there's a dignity about fellowshipping with the one who is none other than the eternal son of God, right? So we've been called into fellowship with his son. And so there's a great dignity in this, that, that the one who is the, the eternal son of God is the one that you and I can enjoy fellowship with this evening. And then, of course, his son, Jesus. And we think of the word Jesus, and we think of that, uh, his humanity, uh, that's the, and we think of the fact that he came down here so that he not only might redeem us, which he did marvelously on the cross, but also that he might be a faithful and sympathetic high priest who knows what it is to live down here. And so it would speak to us of his sympathy, that he's a sympathetic high priest. Jesus, consider the, uh, the profession of our great high priest, epistle to the Hebrews. And then his son, Jesus Christ. Uh, there's a glory of this fellowship. He's, he, he's the Messiah. He's the long promised one. All these promises of this glorious king who is going to reign in righteousness. And we daily can enjoy fellowship, communion, partnership with him. And then, of course, he's our Lord. We're in fellowship with someone. We're enjoying communion with someone. But we never should forget his authority. You see, he is our Lord. And I think that was part of the difficulty in the assembly in Corinth. And we're going to see over and over again, he's going to use the term Lord, 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 because although they were gloriously saved, they had forgotten about the Lordship of Christ. They'd forgotten about his marvelous authority over their lives. And they were very active in many, many things, but the Lordship of Christ was lacking. And that's why he mentions it over and over again. And of course, we have to ask ourselves the question tonight, is he Lord of my life? Is he have the ultimate authority in my life? I know that by resurrection, that God has made this same Jesus, both Lord and Christ, but practically on a daily basis, is he Lord? And so. God is faithful, but whom you are called into the fellowship or the partnership, and the word is often used in that way, a spiritual partnership with him. Of course, part of that partnership with him is sharing in his rejection and suffering, but also sharing in his coming glory. And so in verse 10, it says, now I beseech you, brethren. This is where it gets to become very practical, uh, very uh, much applying the truths uh, that have gone so far. And so he beseeches them. It's a very strong word. He, he's pleading with them. I beseech you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, again, by the authority of that name, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you all speak the same thing. You see, it's amazing. They were all called into fellowship with him, but they were in danger of not enjoying fellowship with one another. <laughs> all the Corinthians were called into the fellowship of his son, but the, the problem was getting on with each other. And so he wants them to be, speak the same thing, to be on the same page, not to be at odds with one another in the assembly. And so if we could kind of think through this, the, just the conclusion of this little section, we're going to think a lot more about verse 10 in a moment, but in, what he's saying to them is, here's what you are, you're saints. Here's what you have, you're enriched. You have his grace that has been given to you through Jesus Christ. You have his gifts, you have his guarantee. Now live up to your position, live up to it. Uh, let it permeate your daily conduct. And here's one area where it needs to permeate. And that is the area of getting on with each other, showing the unity in the local assembly. And so he's beginning to get down to this idea of correcting error. And so he says, I, I want you to kind of on the positive side to speak the same thing, to have a unity in belief to have a un united belief in the, in the core principles of the word of God. Speak the same thing. 
uh, he says he, he would desire that they speak the same, same thing, that there be no divisions among you, but you be perfectly joined. Uh, that word is used of mending nets or resetting bones. In other words, kind of, there's a bit of disjointedness in the assembly because there's these factions, and he wants them to be, uh, as it were, mended and of the same mind together and so he says you speak the same thing there be no divisions among you that you be perfectly joined together in the same mind and in the same judgment now what mind is it that they're to have the same mind well isn't it the mind of christ let this mind be in you which was also in christ jesus and sometimes when we're debating issues one of the things we forget is what's the mind of the lord on this matter what, what is his mind about it so that's the positive side. There's a negative side, and that is, he says that there be no divisions among you, no schisms, no rent amongst you, uh, like the rent veil, torn apart. And of course, the enemy wants to do that. He loves to tear apart God's people. He loves to divide and conquer. That's one of his primary strategies. And so he wants them to be of one mind and one mouth. Uh, like in the early book chapters of the book of Acts, where they were one heart and one soul. And of course, it's a wonderful thing, isn't it? How good and how pleasant the psalmist says for brethren to dwell together in unity. And then he goes on and he talks about for there, God commands the blessing. And, and just a cursory reading of the early chapters of Acts, you'll see this, that when they were of one mind, in one place, of one accord, there was blessing. Yeah, you can see that in assembly life, when there's a togetherness, a common love for the Savior, love for the scriptures, love for his honor, for his mind to be known in the assembly. There's always blessing connected with that. But often what can come in, tragically, is contention. And so he tells us in verse 11, it hath been declared unto me of you, my brethren. Notice he says, my brethren. See, we're all brothers in Christ. And so there ought to be that unity and that harmony amongst the brethren. And he says, being declared unto me, you, my brethren, by them which are the house of Chloe, that there are contentions among you. And so word had come to Paul from the house of Chloe. And we said, these are not idle tattletales. I really believe the house of Chloe were deeply burdened and saddened by the fractions, the factions, the fracture in the assembly, and they, they felt helpless uh, to do anything about it. And so they, they went to someone for help. And who better than the man who under God had been instrumental in star in the work? And so they go to him for help. And this is not uncommon. You see in Colossae, Epaphras sees this false teaching that's come in uh, to the church, and he doesn't feel adequate to deal with it. So he, he goes to see Paul, and he tells Paul, and they pray together, and Paul writes this masterful epistle to help them uh, to understand uh, the errors that were coming in amongst them. And so there's this, it's wonderful. It's a terrible thing to be an, uh, an idle, tattletale type person. But it's another thing to be somebody who is burdened about the spiritual well-being of the assembly and seeks help to remedy things. And we see this with the house of Chloe. And so he says, it's been declared to me there are contentions among you. Now, we need to understand something. And I think there's a big principle here. And you're going to see it all the way through the epistle to the Corinthians. But I want you to look back, please, for a second to book of Proverbs, the book of Proverbs chapter 13 and verse 10 and it's a very powerful scripture that really gives the real reason behind division in the church and contention in the church and this is what it says and i love the way the king james renders it here only brought by pride cometh contention but with the well-advised is wisdom and notice that only exclusively by pride cometh contention. And we can see that throughout the word of God. Uh, we see the, the fall in the heavenly realm. Lucifer, what was behind that? 
I will be like the most high, right? It was pride. He was lifted up because of his beauty. It was a pride thing uh, in the Garden of Eden. What was it? You shall be like gods. And yeah, there's a pride dimension there, isn't there? We want to be like gods. We're not content with where we are and who we are. We want we want to be like God. And so there's this uh, this pride dimension. And so he says, it's been told to me that there are contentions amongst you. And of course, it's only because of pride. And of course, throughout the epistle, you're going to see things like them being puffed up. You're going to see knowledge puffs up because that's just a, this inflated ego, like a balloon full of hot air, appears bigger than it really is, but easily popped. And that's the idea of pride. And it permeated the assembly in Corinth. And so he says in verse 12, now this I say that every one of you saith, I am of Paul and I have Apollos and I have Cephas and I have Christ. Now I want you to notice again, just the simple letter I here. I of, I'm, I'm of Paul. I of Apollos. I of Cephas. I of Christ. And again, we see behind it all, the middle letter of sin is I. The middle letter of pride is I. And so the root of division, sex forming in the, in the assembly, was personalities in the assembly, uh, and also people kind of gathering around them and saying, I am of this one, and I am of that one. And so as we think these names that are mentioned, and we're not really sure whether these were uh, the actual sex that were developing in the assembly, or whether he was just using that as an example, because if you look at chapter four, verse six, he says, these things, brethren, I have in a figure transferred to myself and to Apollos for your sakes, that you might learn in us not to think of men above that which was is written, that no one of you be puffed up for one against another. And so he could be just using these um, as examples, although they, it may be the sex are dividing over other individuals. But you get the idea that he's trying to communicate. So he says, uh, some were saying, I am of Paul, because he was the founder of the assembly under God. Of course, it was just, he was just the instrument, the human instrument. It was a work of the Holy Spirit. We know that. But, but nevertheless, he was the founder. And so maybe there were some who were saved right at the beginning of the work. And so they are very loyal to Paul. We're Paul's men. We're of Paul, you see. He started this work, and we're we're with him, hundred percent. But then, a, 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 sometime after, Apollos had come to the assembly, and he was a very eloquent man, as we know, mighty in the scriptures, and uh, wowed them. Of course, they they love uh, they love uh, speech, you know, kind of attractive speech. And this man's eloquent, and so they're wowed by Apollos. And so he says, uh, "Some are of Paul, some are of Apollos." Uh, and, uh, of course, Paul says, uh, the one who watered after Paul had planted. Uh, we see that in chapter 3 and verses 5 and 6. And so he says, who then is Paul and who is Apollos, but ministers by whom you believed, even as the Lord gave to every man. I have planted Apollos watered, but God gave the increase. So Paul came in under God, saw the work established. Apollos came in, had powerful ministry in the assembly and spoke with group in eloquence and there were a group that said oh we're apollos men how we love apollos uh, he he's so eloquent so gifted we love this guy and then there was some that said we're a cephas man that's the Arama aramaic name for peter uh, peter being the greek name now we're not sure that peter ever visited corinth but he would appeal to the Jewish party, particularly because he was the apostle of the circumcision. And of course, they could say, well, he's he's one of the original 12. You know, he's not this uh, Johnny come lately guy, Paul. These are the original 12. And so we're we stand fully with Peter. And then I of Christ or literally the Christ. Uh, and perhaps in an exclusive sense, he, in other words, he belongs to us and not to others. Of course, he really is the Messiah, but maybe again, this is a Jewish group saved from the synagogue and uh, emphasizing the Messiahship, his Messiahship over Israel, and we're the kind of messianic party in the assembly. And, and so there's these, these divisions. 
And nothing has changed much since the days of the Apostle Paul. The heart of man has not changed. And so we see, as we look at Christendom today, we see all these different sects and all these different parties, and we see how they developed. And it was really 1 Corinthians lived out in reality. And so I'll give you an example. Um, we have the body of Christ divided up into all these different groupings. And so, for instance, they gathered around personalities like Martin Luther, who was quite a personality. If you read his biography and his story, he was a larger than life character. And so there are some that would call themselves by the name Luther. They say, well, we're Lutheran. They like that name. But listen to what Martin Luther had to say. And again, in, in his typical colorful style, he, he says it very, very well. He says this, the first thing I ask is, that people should not make use of my name and should not call themselves Lutherans, but Christians. What is Luther? The teaching is not mine, nor was I crucified for anyone. How did I, poor, stinking bag of maggots that I am, come to the point where people call the children of Christ by my evil name. I love that last statement. How did I, poor stinking bag of maggots that I am, come to the point where people call the children of Christ by my evil name? And of course, it's often been said, let, let sex, was it? Let, let names and sex and parties fall and Jesus Christ be all in all. But we have churches that are gathered on the basis of ordinances. Or Baptists, who particularly are fond of being quote, titled with that, that name. Uh, some, it's to do with their form of church government, or at least what they understand the biblical form of church government to be. They may be off on that, but you've got Episcopalians who have this idea of the bishopric and all the rest of it, Presbyterians, the presbytery, uh, methodology, the Methodists, or even names again, the Wesleyans or whatever. And again, we just see uh, these things even to this day. Even the name brethren, if it's used in an exclusive sense, is a sectarian sin. I'm a Christian, a believer, brethren, saint, anything that could be used of any child of God. And that is exactly how we should call ourselves. We're a companion of all them that fear thy name. And again, as you think about these things, I would say this, I believe in believe is baptism very much so but i'm not a baptist i believe in the plurality of elders but i'm not a presbyterian i believe in the universal church of christ but i'm not catholic <laughs> and so human nature enjoys gravitating to human leaders instead of emphasizing the risen glorious head of the church the lord jesus who is the head of the church, the savior of the body. And it is interesting too, that even in the early days of a recovery of New Testament truth, having met together in wonderful unity from 1826, everything was going smoothly, just gathered, were just Christians gathered to the name of the Lord Jesus. But the power of personality cult always seems to come in and by the time you get to 1848 there's wrangling amongst loyalty to leaders some to mr newton some to mr darby some to mr Mueller, Mueller. and we're, before you know where we are people who understand and are excited about the use of gift the priesthood of all believers people like the corinthians who love the coming of the lord jesus but carnality comes in amongst the ranks, and all of a sudden, there's massive divisions that take place. And oh, if only we would pay attention to the word of God and to the ministry written in 1 Corinthians. And so Paul says, is Christ divided? And again, it's, is the Christ divided? And let me explain what I mean by that. Look at 1 Corinthians 12. 1 Corinthians 12 
and verse 12 and 13. For as the body is one and hath many members, and all the members of that one body being many are one body, so also is Christ. For by one spirit, we're all baptized into one body, whether we Jews or Gentiles, whether we bond or free, we've been all made to drink into one spirit. And then verse 27, please, of the same chapter. Now ye are the body of Christ and members in particular. And so the emphasis that he wants to ask us is this, is Christ divided? If, if there's one body, right, which is the Christ, he's the head, we're the body, is Christ divided? Of course, the answer is no. But yet, tragically, they're forming these groups, these segments, which is devastating. Uh, he says, was Paul crucified for you? Then why become a follower of Paul? There's only one savior. There's only one who died to pay the penalty for your sins. And Paul, again, showing his own insignificance. What did I do? All, I, all he was was a simple messenger. And we need to be caught up with the message rather than the messenger. Caught up with the, the Lord, the savior. And so he says, was Paul crucified you? Or were you baptized in the name of Paul? The question clearly imp implies that baptism followed conversion, right? Were you baptized in the name of Paul? And we have to say this, that, that the, the New Testament is absolutely clear that when somebody got saved, they got baptized, often the same day. But baptism invariably followed conversion. And when they were baptized, who would they baptize in the name of? Well, we, we, remember we baptize, we baptize in the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. So we're acknowledging our belief in the triune God. And then they're, they're baptized to be identified with the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. And so they're not kind of connected with a person actually doing the baptism, but everything about the baptism is speaking about their connection with divine persons. As we've talked about earlier, this fellowship with divine persons, that they're connected with the father son holy spirit that they're like when christ died they died with him when he was buried they were buried when he rose they rose again and it's wonderful truth but somehow sadly um they had divided into these groups and paul is trying to kind of get them to think through these things were you baptized in the name of paul no you were not baptized in the name of paul and then he says, I thank God that I baptized none of you, but Crispus and Gaius, lest any should say I've been baptized in my own name. And again, our time is gone. So we'll have to wait, uh, hopefully with eager anticipation, uh, if the Lord be not come, to learn a little bit more about the ones that Paul did baptize and why he didn't make it a practice to baptize under normal circumstances. But up to now, we want to just close with this simple thought, and that is this. Do we know what our gifts are, and are we using those gifts? Are we staggered that we've been called into fellowship with divine persons? And even though we long for the coming of the Lord Jesus, do we have that purifying hope in the sense that he who has this hope in him purifies himself even as he is pure? In other words, is our knowledge going from the head to the heart to the will and resulting in holy conduct let's pray father we're thankful for this uh, very practical epistle and we can see uh, the havoc that has come in to the church of the lord jesus because we haven't really taken seriously the exaltation the pleadings of the apostle and we do pray father that there would be true unity in the churches in various locations. Oh, Lord, how wonderful it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. And we pray, Father, deliver us from pride and from the flesh and from the eye problem that so often causes this to occur. And we'll give thee the glory. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen.